many folks will come back at me when I say that and say precautionary principle. And for those of you that don't know, the precautionary principle says, yeah, you may be right. It may not be very good risk benefit trade off, cost benefit trade off. But if you look at the tail of distribution of outcomes, if you look at, you know, say there's still some small percentage chance of a catastrophic outcome, then because of that small chance, because the outcome is so catastrophic, no matter how small a probability you put on it, it still says that it makes sense to spend a ton of money today to try to avoid even that small percentage outcome. And they'll often say, well, you know, you buy insurance on your car, you don't necessarily think you're going to wreck it, you know, isn't that a good investment? And I have a couple of thoughts of that. First is, yes, I buy insurance on my car, but I wouldn't if the premiums on that cost me more than the value of the car. So I wouldn't pay $30,000 a year in insurance to avoid a $20,000 loss, which is some extent what I believe we're doing with CO2 abatement. The cost of CO2, I don't think people understand them. They're really staggering. And a lot of the media, I think, really tries to underestimate it by showing cutesy stories of little kids you know, drying their diapers on the washing line outside or collecting a few cans. We're talking about stupendous changes in the economy to make, to make even small changes in CO2 output. Um, many folks are advocating a 80% reduction by 2050 of our CO2 output. That's a, they call it 20 by 50, to be at 20% of our current output by 2050. The Europeans are nowhere near that goal. I mean, they're just they're light years away, and they already have 8 or $9 gas. And in the United States this year, when we went from under $2 to $4 gas, our driving miles went down by something like 3%. To get an 80% reduction in our gasoline use, in our fuel use, in our coal use, and all the use of these fuels would take such staggering high prices for gas. I mean, we're talking 20 30 $40 gas to get the kind of reductions they're talking about. California often trumpets, and I know Joe Nation has mentioned this a little bit before I got up, that California has done some smart things with regulation to get some big benefits, and they're the lowest per capita electricity use of any state. But that's you know attributing the gain, I think, attributing their, their low per capita energy use to the wrong things, because it's trying to attribute it to some simple regulations, when in fact there's, there's much better explanations. For example, California has the eighth highest electricity prices in the country. Um, it has the tenth smallest industrial sector. Uh, even for this huge state, it's because California, with its regulation, has chased much of the industrial base out of the state, and those you know use a lot less electricity because there's no big industries using electricity. And of course, California has the single mildest climate in, in, in the United States. And so, the combination of all of these really is what adds up to having a low per capita energy use. It's not because they mandated you know, a certain kind of insulation in houses, uh, though that might have had some small factor. It's real things that cost money, higher energy prices, less industry. That's going to be what has to happen to meet these CO2 targets, and I don't think the country is prepared to pay that kind of cost, particularly when the benefits are so much in doubt. One of the things you can just talk about from a worldwide level, I have a real problem with the CO2 abatement initiative when we get outside the United States. I think in the United States we can probably afford we're a rich country. We can afford a lot of things. It'll be painful, but we could probably afford to to do some CO2 reduction, not the amount they're talking about, because 80% uh, reduction below 1990 levels would take us about to the CO2 and, and fuel consumption that we had around 1915, I think. So I, I don't think we can get that far, but we're a rich country. We can afford a lot of stuff. But there's a lot of poor countries. There's billions of people that are just emerging from po poverty in Asia who would like to emerge from poverty in Africa. And really that emergence from poverty really depends on burning every scrap of cheap fossil fuels they can get their hands on, to burn it to power their hospitals, to burn it to pump clean water out of their wells, to burn it to, to have basic industries that can start providing good jobs to people, to burn it to, to provide farm machinery to increase their agricultural productivity. And, and you can see it very directly. You go, I went into online, and there's a, there's a nice site where you can do some cool graphs. And I actually did a graph of the world, and I asked just to put two things against each other. How much each country, the, the CO2 emissions, tons per person, and I took their life expectancy, just as one measure of quality of life. And you can see there's a pretty direct relationship between CO2 emissions and life expectancy, and that's not random. Um, fossil fuels and energy production 
And in our modern economy, it's what allows us to live longer. Most of us forget that the U.S., even in the U.S., our average life expectancy in the 19th century was something like the age of 40. It's, it's, it's all these modern appliances and, and modern hospitals and clean water and modern pumps pumping that clean water that, that let us live so long. In fact, if you look at this regression, every, uh, every 10x increase, every 10 times increase in CO2 output increases life expectancy by about 15 years. It, there's a tremendous straight line relationship between you know, burning fossil fuels, which is our cheapest form of producing energy, and, and, and development and longer life and prosperity for people who've lived in poverty for generations. And so we may be able to afford it as sort of a rich man's toy in the U.S. to make ourselves feel better that we're doing something for the environment. But, but in countries like Africa and Asia, the CO2 reduction is literally an issue of life and death. And it makes zero sense. It's the last thing these guys need to be worried about. Um, finally, here in the U.S., it seems that uh, with the political changes going on here in 2008, that some kind of plan uh, for CO2 reduction is almost inevitable. I'm, I'm hoping it's not too onerous and that you know a quick failure will show the world that it needs to back off this plan. But I think it's almost inevitable. One plea is nowadays so many people seem attached to this cap-and-trade system. But the cap-and-trade system is a lobbyist dream. It provides nearly infinite space for influence peddling, special deals, exemptions. And you can see that already with the California Air Resource Board and the discussion that we've had today with the rural county commissioners. Everybody here has examples of the arbitrariness and the political dealing that's going on and CARB setting these various cap-and-trade targets for various industries. And there's a whole lot of unfairness already coming out, and it's just going to get worse. The simplest way to deal with this is just a carbon tax. Put a straight carbon tax on it and let economics and the price signal cause people to make their own choices of where they reduce CO2. And it just makes a ton more sense. The problem is that politicians are gutless. They do not want to put a, anything that looks like a tax. Cap and trade is very much of a tax. It has the same effect as a tax. In fact, it's worse because it's less efficient. But politicians like it because it's hidden. And it doesn't look like they put a tax on it. But it, in the end, it raises prices and has the same effects on, on availability of products as would a tax. It's just hidden and less efficient. But that's the, the, the type of thing politicians like to do. Also, there's no lobbying that anybody can do on a carbon tax. The carbon tax is the carbon tax. There's a ton of lobbying that they can do on a cap-and-trade system. And so this is a way that politicians can get a lot of attention for lobbyists and special interests, bring a lot of campaign money from people that want their industry to get a special exemption or some kind of special uh, notice on the cap-and-trade system. And I'll make one other observation. About 20 years ago, Al Gore was, for these reasons, a very big proponent of the carbon tax. Since then, Al Gore has joined the board of about a $2 billion investment company that makes investments in companies that depend upon using special allowances under cap-and-trade system to try to make money for themselves. Al Gore no longer supports a carbon tax, uh, which just goes to highlight how much a cap-and-trade system is really about rent-seeking. It's about individual companies and firms and lobbyists trying to find niches for themselves to try to extract money based upon these government mandates. And it is just a bad system and a carbon tax is something that I greatly advocate as an alternative.